Hello, and welcome to Monumental, where we sit down with entrepreneurs, leaders, visionaries, and big thinkers making monumental change. Here's your host, Evan Holliday. Welcome to Monumental. I'm your host, Evan Holliday, and today we have on the show with us a friend of mine, Jake Stenziano. Jake, how you doing, man? Doing great. Thanks for having me here. Yes. Uh, so a, a quick background on Jake before we get started. So Jake and I have known each other for about the last year. Um, him and Gino put on some phenomenal events, amazing community. I can speak to it personally. Um, really just great, great people putting out great work. Um, but a, a little bit about Jake, best-selling author of two books, Wheelbarrow Profits and The Honeybee. Uh, he's also the co-founder of Jake and Gino, the only multifamily real estate investment education company that teaches investors the three pillars of sound apartment investing, buy right, manage right, and finance right. Uh, he's also the founder of Rand Property Management, as well as Rand Capital and Rand Partners. Uh, and their management company is the first uh, with a focus on modern affordability and vertical integration. Uh, and I love that. We'll touch on that in today's episode. Uh, and then finally, creator of the multifamily investing framework, Wheelbarrow Profits. He's a leading expert on investing in and management of the multifamily space and currently owns over 1,500 multifamily units. Uh, he lives in Knoxville, Tennessee with his beautiful wife, Whitney, and their two kids. So with that, Hey, and, and we got one on the way too, so you got to give that one some props too if we're talking. Yeah, about yeah. That, so. Give him some early <laughs> props. I like it. Uh, with that, Jake, let's just dive right in, man. Let's dive into a little bit of your background and then uh, how you got to where you are today. Sure. Hey, thanks so much, Evan, for having me. Um, you know, my background uh, was, you know, a, a journey that started in sales like so many people. Um, you know, I, was, I grew up in a very small town in Western New York. Um, it was about less than 2,000 people. And I, it was about 15, I grew up 15 minutes outside of that town. Uh, you know, on a dirt road, literally in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so <clears throat> growing up in a small town in Western New York, a lot of people uh, have, you know, maybe realized that it's called the Rust Belt uh, because there was so many steel jobs that have gone away and, and the economy is very depressed in Western New York. Uh, you know, Kodak has gone under, Xerox has, 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 you know, really downsized. So growing up in a small town like that, there were, was a big central school where all the, the towns around the area pooled together to make up this, this one school. So a lot of the, the, you know, my experience was with you know, teachers and I played sports. So I was like, well, maybe I'll become a gym teacher or maybe I'll be, you know, become a cop. There just wasn't a, a whole lot of opportunities. Yeah, those are your role a, models. I don't even know that they were my role models. I just didn't know what else, like what else. And, <laughs> and there was the a factory, there's, yeah. there's a factory called Gunlocks that made chairs. And, and so I had no, no exposure to entrepreneurship. Um, just really, there was, that was, you know, my life experience. I didn't, you know, not much more to go off than that. So, you know, being a little bit of a meathead, being into sports, I, I was like, all right, I went to play, played a little college football, figured I'd become a gym teacher because it, it's really all I knew. And, and I got rejected uh, when I took one of the, the state police exams because I failed the psychological. So it was a good thing that I didn't, didn't go down that route. And uh, that was, I was cut off early from that. But um, <laughs> realistically, it was, I was in my uh, senior year of college and I was driving back to my parents' house and, and I called my dad I just said, like, I don't, I don't think I'm cut out for this, this teaching stuff. Um, you know, these kids don't want to play sports. You know, it's, I'm going out to the, the schools in Rochester, New York, and um, th these kids are rejecting, you know, going out and playing flag football. And, and I just couldn't comprehend. I'm like, this is the best part of your day, and you're rejecting it. And I started feeling like this glorified babysitter. Um, at the time, I was actually working at Radio Shack. It was a 100% commission sales job. And I became the number one sales rep in the uh, Rochester district for, you know, three or four months in my time there. So it really opened my eyes. And I was just kind of having this epiphany moment with my father. I was like, I, I, I can't go on with this. And he's like, well, listen, I'll, uh, I'll have you sit down with some of the drug reps at work and, uh, you know, we'll see what that path looks like. So the, the interesting thing about this is that I got a framework from this Amgen rep. And he said, you know, you, you put together this pitch book and you start detailing your successes in it. He said, finish your bachelor's degree, okay? And, and detail your sales successes and get an outside sales job. He said, after one year, you should be able to get in. So I, I took very detailed notes. So I'm like, all right, I gotta detail my successes, the sales awards I'm winning at Radio Shack, get a bachelor's degree, and then, you know, go out and, and prove myself an outside sales for one year. 
Simple as that. I, I followed the yellow brick road. I did exactly what this guy told me to do. Graduated, got an um, outside business to business cell phone sales job because it was an easy transition from Radio Shack because we we're doing a lot of Sprint and Verizon at the time. And, um, you know, I, I did that for a year, did really well in, uh, in that sales job and then got into pharmaceutical sales. And I was like, dude, I, I made it. You know, that was done <laughs> at that point. Like, yeah. like coming, coming from a small town, I'm, I'm six figures and I have a company <clears> car. <throat> I thought you're like, this is it. I'm, I'm here for life. I'm sorry. You're going to say something. Yeah. I was just going to ask, uh, the, the pitch book you mentioned, was that part yeah. of you getting to that step of becoming a pharmaceutical sales rep? hundred percent. So what the pitch book was, was this leather bound binder that, um, you know, I, I started with my radio shack days. I, I think I, I worked there for like t- a total of maybe six months after, after, you know, in, in totality. And I literally, I think out of the, out of those six months, I was the number one sales rep in the whole district for like five of them. And I, wow. and I just would, I would, I would just take every customer that came in. They, they tried to bring people in from other districts to like throw me off my game and I just buried their asses. So, I mean, I'm just, I got a, I got a lot of fire in my belly. I'm extremely competitive. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, I just, that, that was my jam and, uh, and I loved doing that. But uh, so I detailed all of that. Um, I got in at the, uh, at the cell phone company, I got promoted within three months, you know, continued to be the number one performer with, within that company. And then literally, I think at like 11 months, um, I got in with a, a top three pharma manufacturer, you know, pharmaceutical manufacturer. The, the funny thing was right before I took the job, I had another offer from a lesser company. And, you know, they said, look, we need a decision from you now. But I knew I had uh, uh, Glaxo was the company that actually I ended up taking the job with that, that offer was pending. And I actually told the the other company no, no. Um, and this was like my dream, and I was like, yeah, oh, man, that's hope powerful. You know what you're doing, but that's rolling the dice, right? Yeah, and sometimes, exactly. sometimes, like I, I was like this close to gold, but I held out for for something better. And uh, you know, getting in those first few years with uh, Glaxo was was completely amazing. I mean, it was it was you know it's something we talked about before the shows. It was great culture in the beginning, and um, I, and I really learned so much about corporate business development. I, I you know I joined different you know organizations within the company. Um, you know, I did my MBA there and I was, I was, you know, on these different tracks, you know, in, inside the organization. And, and I learned a lot about what good culture looked like, but I also learned what bad culture looked like because during my time there, healthcare yeah. reform came down in 2008. Healthcare reform, in my opinion, destroyed, you know, the, the, the fun part of the pharmaceutical industry. It, it, it changed, you know, all the regulations started coming down. You're, you're evil, you know, you're, you're just basically a bad person, you know, to even be involved with it. And so I was like, this is not no longer fun. Uh, it's, it's, they wanted me to go in after that, read this script. Like I was a human commercial to the doctors. I was getting graded on that. It was a miserable, it became a miserable experience. And then yeah. because the regulations came down, they started laying people off every year. So every year it was go sit by the phone and we'll let you know if you wow. have a job or not. That sounds it, miserable. It, 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 it went from, you know, hero to zero real quick. And, yeah. and I loved it. And then I hated it. And it was just, it was because the culture changed though. Yeah. Um, and so from there, what I started also seeing was the doctors lost their autonomy because every, everything is shrinking. Everything is tightening in 2008. And so what they, the doctors started doing that I was calling on, they were joining these medical groups. And so you had these people that were essentially entrepreneurs um, losing their autonomy, losing their employees, and then being gobbled up and absorbed by these medical groups, all of them except for one. And I started, you know, developing a good relationship with this guy. And I, I tried figuring out, like, what's the difference here? What, wh- why am I missing? Like, he's not joining the group. Literally, he was the only guy left yeah. in the county that didn't do it. And it turned out that he was involved in real estate. And, and he owned real estate all up and down the eastern seaboard. And so he was a doctor because he chose to be. He, he wanted to do yeah. it. And his wealth came from real estate. And, and he had so, that freedom to make that choice. Yeah. And so, but this guy was like the most charitable guy in the community. He, he was a part of the firefighters. He, he donated a ton of money. I mean, th- this is, uh, it, it was Dr. Neshawa, you know, for those of you in, you know, um, in Westchester know, I mean, this guy, he's the real deal. Um, you know, he, he took care of his family first. The best advice he ever gave me, by the way, was he said, I didn't own a house at the time. He said, buy a duplex, rent out half of it. You know, it was the whole house hack. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and he said he did that when he got out of medical school and uh, he had a hard time convincing his wife of it because she's like, yo, you're the doctor. You're supposed to be doing this, but yeah. Yeah. So literally, he started out, you know, out the game house hacking, didn't need to, and started accumulating wealth through real estate. And, and he was able to preserve, you know, his, his life and his freedom uh, because of that, while everyone else was, you know, becoming W-2 employees. So that, that yeah. was a big impression on me. And he was, you know, at the time, that was my first true mentor saying, hey, Jake, I see that you're a guy, you know, with a lot of ambition and, and you, you want to, you know, better yourself. He said, start to look into real estate. And that's when he was talking to me about house hacking and things. 
Um, at that same time, though, I'm, I'm looking at things and I'm saying, look, man, the weather in New York sucks. You're going to get whacked at least 50% on taxes. And I said, there's, there's other options. So I started this Excel sheet and I was looking for different places to live that I was ranking it on like state income tax, property taxes, and weather. And so those were my three, you know, sort of, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. how I filtered it. And, and so like, you know, uh, Texas was coming up. I was looking at Tennessee. I was looking at like, you know, parts of Northern Florida. And, um, you know, we started visiting these places and, and my wife liked the idea of being able to drive back to New York. And so, you know, East Tennessee kind of came, came on the radar and, uh, man, did, did we get lucky because what a phenomenal state. I, I think, you know, I'm the luckiest guy in the world just because I live in Tennessee. I think it's the greatest <laughs> place. No, I really do. Like, I truly believe awesome. that this is the greatest place in the nation. If you look on the freedom index, the United States comes in like 15th, 16th, but if you broke it down by the 50 States, like. Tennessee is the spot to live if you're a freedom lover. I mean, I absolutely love, love, love living in Tennessee. But, um, you know, so, so long story short, there was a uh, job opening, you know, within the same company. And the guy happened to be, uh, the manager for that territory happened to be from New Jersey. And so I think that was like my saving grace. So I started interviewing. He didn't pay for any of my, my travel. Like the company usually would like, you know, fly you in to take, you know, like different lateral transfers. The guy was putting me through the ringer, like multiple interviews, was calling me at like six o'clock at night to see if I'd pick up. Cause he's like, he wanted to make sure like this was the real deal, but he's like, I get why you want to move, but I want to make sure that, you know, the, the motivation's there. So he was, he was whooping my ass, but you know, eventually I got in, uh, did really well here, but this, it was the same type of, you know, thing that the, the job security just wasn't really there. Um, never made more than really the day I started. I made a little bit more than six figures in the beginning. And when I left, I kind of made the same thing because I kept tweaking the commission structure. So there was really, there was just no, you know, improvement in, in, in life. I mean, you know, inflation was there, things kept getting more expensive and I kept making the same, even though they, they, they yeah. kept with the commission. So ultimately um, before I left, um, I actually mentioned my partner, Gino, um, he was, he was into real estate. He had been, you know, educated, you know, in multifamily. And so he said, when you get down there, um, let's, let's take a look at some deals because I was in his restaurant before I left, you know, I used to hang out with his brother a lot and he, we were just looking at some stuff on LoopNet, and there's like these like little mom and pop apartments that were, you know, 30,000 a unit. And, and this is going back uh, to 2010 before I left. I had no idea what that meant, if that was good or not, but I'm like, look, I know Dr. Neshwat said get into real estate. So, yeah. and, and, and like, you know, follow my mentors. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So everyone's like pointing, go, go this way. I was, I was at the time, you know, again, going back to being into fitness and things, I was looking at maybe like healthy vending, you know, something that could be passive. I was looking at you know, maybe doing a fitness center or something, but um, ultimately I was very lucky that, you know, I had the right people guiding me into the right asset class. Um, one thing that I truly believe is that, you know, you hear the Steve Jobs quote that, you know, if you find your passion, you'll never work a day in your life. And, and I tried that. Like I literally was a personal trainer out of college, started hating going to the gym. People were like whining, why are, you know, don't make me do the extra sit-ups, Jake, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I hated it when I was, when I was you know, trying to be a gym teacher, the people were like, you know, whining. Cause so I'm like, I'm trying to like follow that advice and follow yeah. my passion. And every time it's screwing me. So I started to like get, you know, kind of hip to that. And, and so what I realized through my journey in real estate up to this point is that if you have the right vehicle and, and you get damn good at it, that's when it gets fun. And that's when it gets exciting. That's when you can start creating a life of abundance, you know, helping others. That's when life gets, you know, really, really fun. So that's, that's my personal, you know, take on it. So, uh, you know, Steve Jobs had a phenomenal career. You'd be lucky to, you know, do a fraction of what that guy did, but, uh, can't say I necessarily agree with that, but you know, maybe he had a different twist on it, you know, who's to say, but, uh, ultimately, yeah. ultimately we started, um, you know, get, when I first came down here in, in 2011, looking at deals and it took us two years, um, to get a first, that first deal. But remember I was, I went back to that pitch book that, that I used in the pharmaceutical industry Yeah, that, exactly. actually, that actually became what we, we refer to now as our credibility book. And it shows like our business plan and it's, we're able to present it to brokers and bankers. And that, uh, that kind of transformation of that pitch book into the credibility book helped us get our first deal, believe it or not, in 2013. That's awesome. Yeah, I love, I love that you circled back to that because I think the, the credibility of the pitch book in any sense in any business, even to just pitch your own services is so important. I had maybe five or six years ago, I had uh, an attorney, I was working on a real estate deal. Uh, I was currently a W2 employee. And um, it was in Chattanooga. And he was telling me he's like, he's like, you know, I asked him, I was like, he's very successful, one of the top attorneys there. I just curious. I was like, hey, you know, what, what in your eyes has made you so successful? And 
he, he said one of the biggest things was one of his mentors to, told him, make a pitch book for himself for all of his services that he did for the company. And then every year, bring that up to the company. And even if you're just within a company job, just pitching yourself every year and highlighting all of your successes and how much money you've made or how much impact you've made on the company and the growth of the company um, can be phenomenal just to be able to ask for a raise or bonuses or more responsibility. And yeah, you got to update it once a year. Even so even when yeah. I was in corporate, I would update that thing. And I ended up having like three versions, you know, I started like having my own like, like yeah. shelf of it. but then, but even now we have, we still have a credibility book and we'll add the deals to it that we've yeah, done exactly. all the successes. And you know, it's, it's a little different now because we have, you know, various books that we publish and podcasts. So, you know, yeah. our exposure is not, you know, it's, it's, it's grown a lot from what it used to be, but we still continue to update that thing. So, yeah. Yeah. And so fast forward to today, I think it's so powerful. Like if you're in real estate, whether you're doing your first job or your 10th deal, um, just having an updated version of that, like every time we send out ours, it's like you see lenders, you see equity people, they see it. They're like, oh, these guys are professional. They're legit. They do what they say they're going to do. They have experience, their track record, and this is what they stand for. And it just such so easily spells it out for people. I think sometimes people try to move too quickly and forget that, you know, if you can easily spell it out in a, in a nice, well put together document, it goes a long way. Yeah. Cause even this year alone, we've added, we have our own insurance. Now we, we have a, a captive that we're doing renter's insurance on. So we have our own renter's insurance company and we added flooring. Um, so we, hmm. we like the vertical integration. So our renovations team now is doing, doing our flooring in house as well. So wow. as these things, you know, expand, it's good to document this stuff so you can share it because Hey, maybe someone yeah. is going to invest with us and they're like, shit, these guys, you know, even do the flooring in house. I can only yeah. imagine how much that's going to save and, and what that's going to do to our returns. It's good to see, it's good to share, and it doesn't matter if it's a banker, you know, an investor, whoever it may be, a broker, it's, it's good to get that out there. And it doesn't have to be crazy. You know, it doesn't have to be this super elaborate thing. I think just making sure you're hitting on the highlights uh, it goes a long way. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I'm glad I've you brought that up. I've seen some fancy ones though. I've definitely seen some fancy <laughs> ones. I, I'm not knocking those, but yeah, just getting, getting started with it's important. Yeah, and, and it led to your first deal. Um, oh, yeah. So dive into that a little bit. What was that like doing your first deal? Yeah, it was, it was pretty cool because it was actually an owner finance deal. And so, you know, I was sitting across from uh, the banker uh, that was, you know, doing, he did, um, he did 80% of it. Um, we did 10% uh, seller finance of the down payment, and then we brought 10% to the table. And I just remember having, you know, they teach you to read upside down in pharma. So I literally slid it across the table for the folks at YouTube and you have your pen and you kind of go through and you detail as you read. So I was going through, you know, the business plan, what we we're going to do for renovations. Uh, it was weekly renters. So we had a plan to move off of the weekly renters to more stabilized and, and all these things that we implemented. And the, the banker was comfortable with it. It was kind of this very hairy deal that no one wanted to buy. It was, you know, it was in a good area, but they just had very transient folks. They were doing weekly renters, cash, yeah. et cetera. The reason the banker was good with it is because he had it for 10 years. They had the deal for quite a while and he saw the cash flow on it. So that even gave me confidence that the banker wanted to do it. Other people were looking at it saying, kind of holding their nose, oh, this thing looks ugly. Uh, but man, to this day, we're cash flowing like six grand a month on this 25 unit wow. property. Yeah. And so it's like people are like, oh, why don't you sell like these smaller ones that you get? Dude, if it's making money you yeah. know, and it's not this bear to manage and it's next to a larger property, we love that stuff. So I don't, I don't, you know, I don't uh, hold my nose at it. I love, you know, being in multifamily for the cash flow. That's, that's prime, like my primary focus. So, um, yeah. And then you, and I, I completely agree with that. Like we, we even have like a, a smaller deal, like a 10 unit, same thing. Cash flows like crazy, just well located and, um, and got it for a good price. And, and, it's amazing. Even smaller deals can, and especially if you can own all or, or most of it, then you're getting all the cash flow instead of splitting it up among 30 or 40 investors. Exactly. Um, and, and so like even our first thousand units, my partner Gina and I did, we bought those internally. So we call them legacy deals because we do some syndications now as well. Right. But I love just buying apartments, you know, and so we, we, we bought them, we fixed them up, we, we call it refi and roll, we'd refi the cash out, we used a lot of community banks. I know everyone's like, ah, you can't use community banks, recourse debt helped us out a lot because we're getting it yeah. 15% down. So we we're getting 85% loan to value on a lot of those yeah. deals. Definitely some risks there, but it allowed us to do so much more because we didn't have to come to the table with as much capital. Um, yeah. But I, I think the, you know, the reason that I love multifamily investing so much is because if you look at the income side of the equation, 
we're, we're getting tremendous cash flow, but also it's the depreciation that you get. If, if you're truly a manager and you can qualify as a real estate professional, doing a couple deals a year, stacking that cash flow, stacking those assets. And then if you continue to buy, you continue to cost seg, you, you're operating in a great uh, you know, perspective from the tax side of things. And then, you know, from, from, you know, the expense side, just from a personal finance standpoint, um, just killing your personal debt. You know, we have now we roll everything out to Fannie Freddie, you get the non-recourse stuff going, but you know, I think it, it just is, is one of the best opportunities for folks to build wealth in, in the United States. If they, uh, if they kind of go that route. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think a great example of that is a uh, tax-free wealth, Tom Wheelwright, phenomenal book just outlines all of what you're saying is like, there's so many tax benefits to this with the losses, mm -hmm. the depreciation, I mean, uh, most savvy real estate investors won't even really pay taxes or will pay very little. Um, we got a pretty substantial check back in the mail. Taxes, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, payroll and property tax. But, and, and, um, and we haven't gone uh, obligated members, so we pay a lot of F&E and, and, and these other things. But yeah, it's, it's still, it's, it's a sweet deal for sure. Yeah, yeah. So that you have this opportunity where, like you said, you can have that semi-passive income and be able to wipe out a lot of your taxable income uh, because of real estate. Um, so I'm glad you touched on that. So, so walk me through, oh, one other thing I want to bring up. You mentioned community banks. I love community banks love um, because you're exactly right. I mean, they're, they're usually more flexible. They're usually uh, lower costs up front as well. And sometimes they can even finance your rehab costs, which Fannie and Freddie loan to cost. is a lot harder it's, to it's do. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, we, we, we did exactly. that a, a couple of years ago. And yeah, we'll, we'll carry anywhere from three to 10 million bucks with our community bank at a time. And then, and they know the deal. We just roll it out. You know, every time we, we, if we do buy it, we get it fixed up and we roll it out to agency and, and, and they're good with it because, you know, we, we yeah. keep a couple million uh, bucks, uh, you know, just in, in operating accounts with these guys and, and they love yeah. that because it gives them the opportunity to lend more. So it's, you can more. really develop a relationship, find a community bank in your town that is looking to grow. Uh, that's flexible on, on yeah. the loan to value, maybe willing to do some of the rehab cost and grow with them and give them all your demand deposits, give them all the operating accounts. And that's what uh, we've done very well. And it's, it's been a great relationship. So, yeah, I, I would second that wholeheartedly. It's find a good relationship and grow with them. Um, so, so fast forward to today, you, you built out the legacy projects uh, with you and just you and Gino. Um, and then now you are syndicating deals, rolling in investors, um, partnering with investors. W walk us through that transition. What was that like for you guys? Yeah, and, and it really wasn't even a, a transition. It was just, we like to have as many resources available as possible because we've done owner finance deals. Um, we've used community banks. We've we used agency. Um, and so it's just, you know, okay, a $30 million, de $30 million deal comes down the line. And it's like, oh shit, maybe we don't have the capital to do it. Why, you know, not be able to take that deal down? Why not bring, yeah. our, you know, friends and family that are that are willing to help us do that? And part of it was also there was it was funny because early on, I you know, I was blowing up my my four hundred one k, my Roth IRA, you know, doing the HELOC, anything I could to pull in money for these deals. Yeah. Uh, I borrowed money from my grandparents, and, and so it was like. You know, I was like this, this guy just begging me, can, can someone give me money? And then it yeah. gets to a point where it's like, now people are asking, Hey, can I get in on this with you? Can I do this? Yeah. Early on, it was like, you're, you're the big risk. And now it's like, Hey, you know, I was just thinking you got any room in yeah. the next one kind of thing. So, so yeah. people started asking. And, and so we were like, okay, what do we do? You know, we had a lot of people, you know, trying to, to participate. And so we said, Hey, let's, let's figure it out. Let's open it up. And, um, you know, now we're even looking at a fund, um, for a quarter three priority this year, um, you know, probably going to be putting a fund together, uh, just so that it's not, you know, the, the, the mad dash to the finish line. Just, you know, I like, I like being well prepared and, and uh, you know, going in with confidence. So. Yeah. Having the ability to pull a trigger quickly on deals too. Yeah. What, what's, what's that been like um, getting ready for that fund and setting that up? You know, it hasn't been much. We use a uh, Kim Taylor um, syndication attorney. So she kind of is always, she's got great resources out there and uh, definitely highly recommend Kim. So, you know, we kind of have our, our normal, like whenever we're trying to do something new with her, we'll have this, you know, one or two hour long call where I ask all these stupid questions and then she starts pointing us in the right direction, you know, puts us in right with, uh, puts in touch like fund administrators and, and, and things like that. So it hasn't been, you know, it hasn't been too bad. Um, probably going to get it kicked off in actually the next few weeks, um, get, get the ball rolling on it though. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That, that is, I think kind of the, the next evolution. Um, once you have the built-in community of investors, of partners, of credibility and experience, 
uh, being able to raise a fund just gives you that kind of dry powder that you can quickly move on a deal that's maybe very competitive and you can come in and, and offer something quickly or just not have that like mad dash to raise, you know, five to $10 million, if that's what it is uh, for a deal, you already have that ready. Um, so I, I think that's powerful if you, once you get to that point. Yeah. And we, we always participate fairly heavily, even on the syndicated deals, you know, we're, we're putting in our own capital and making sure that, you know, people are feeling good about it and we have skin in the game as well. So, and the same thing with the, with the fund. So right now, um, kind of, what are we like, uh, four months into COVID four or five months, something like that. Um, let's call it what July, it, 2020, right? Let's not yeah, be yeah. dictated by this thing, right? <laughs> yeah. July, 2020. What, what are your thoughts for the next six months? And then after that, as far as your investing philosophy? Yeah. So it's, you know, I was actually speaking to the team about this earlier and it's, it's, interesting to look at hospitality throughout all this. And, and there's a few key points. I'm thrilled that I'm not in traditional travel and hospitality because yeah. it, you know, and, and you've seen it going back even 10 years when, when these other things popped up, not nearly as severe as this. They're getting, they're getting hit pretty good. You know, I, I think there's a, there's a lot more risk there. Um, I like to keep it really boring. We, we, we preach that like, we just, we just want to, you know, have nice steady growth, nice steady cash flow. Uh, so we've been very fortunate through this whole thing. Um, you know, the one thing that I said to the team when all this came out was we're going to do everything in our power to make sure no one loses their job. We've expanded, you know, throughout this, this entire, um, you know, pandemic. And the, the takeaway is that while, uh, you know, the, the different hospitalities have been getting beat up, we've been focusing on the hospitality aspect of our business. Um, you mentioned modern affordability before. I believe our blue ocean strategy is to become the Chick-fil-A of apartments. What I mean by that is excellent customer service in the C and B space. I think that when you, when you offer really good service to folks in the C and B space, their eyes are open because it's not been the norm. And, yeah. and that's where we, we, we work every day to excel at. We have something that we're working on called a customer service journey. Uh, it's, it's just a customer journey, but really think customer service journey. What's that um, you know, day-to-day -day, uh, relationship like with your property management company? Uh, so we're, we're working on various things where uh, you know, when, you, when you come in, there's, uh, we're expanding on our gift packages. We're expanding on our communication. The different videos and touch points uh, are going to be you know, really juiced up. Uh, so that's, that's big, but also making sure that, you know, you're not having to reach out to us if there's a maintenance issue. Uh, one of the implementations that we're doing with our customer service journey is we're going to do text messages once a month asking, do you have any, um, you know, uh, concerns? Do you need us to come out so that you're going to have that right on your text? No one wants to pick up the phone and speak to anybody anymore. Just, you're going to get a little bing from us. You can opt out, but then you can respond back. Oh, uh, you know, my toilet's running a little bit or whatever the case may be. So we're offering that super high level of service. Uh, we rolled out our maintenance training, which is in our actual Kajabi product. We have an education company as well. And, and the great thing is we have this LMS that we're able to utilize for the Jake and Gino brand for the property management as well. So now we're working on our in-house, you know, customer journey and customer service hmm. uh, for the PM side. And, and even with our maintenance folks, we have a dedicated YouTube page. So if someone's out there and like, oh crap, I forgot how to change a thermostat. We have a video of our our folks, they can go right on their cell phone, pull it up and get real time information in the field. So we're really focused on training development, culture, and, and just making it the, the best place for, um, you know, whether it's, it's our, our, you know, RPM folks, rent property management, or, um, you know, our, our end residents. Uh, that's, that's really what the day to day is, uh, you know, for us trying to make sure that it's just those great experiences. That's powerful, man. I love, I love how I just hear in the way you're talking, you have clarity uh, and, and like a direction and where you guys are going, you know, you said, you know, Chick-fil-A of B, C class properties, and you want to focus on the hospitality of the experience. Uh, I think that's so powerful. And I love how you're, you're taking this look of like, Hey, this is what's going on with hospitality. Let's, let's offer even better hospitality on our end. Uh, and I think you're right. If you can differentiate yourself in that space and offer, you know, head over heels, better, better service than everybody else then you'll gain a, just a loyal, uh, loving customer base that wants to keep coming back and telling all their friends and having a great, great experience. You said something extremely powerful for entrepreneurs, and that's clarity. 
Um, we've worked very hard in the last two years on our business systems and our, our scale. Um, we, we've, uh, you know, scaling up the Rockefeller habits. We look at it every Monday. And we're always identifying where we're weak in the rock habits and trying to improve on them. But, you know, one part of the scaling up strategy is you do quarterly planning sessions. And essentially that is your clarity. What does the next quarter look like? So, so we have a mortgage company, we have property management, we, we have education, we have the, the syndication. So we have this family of companies and we know going into the meeting loosely what those priorities are going to be. We heat map them in the meeting and, and we stress test them. So like you may have someone else calling you out saying, is that really a priority? And then everyone's given input. And so that clarity into where the business is going, you know, uh, and, and we have a beautiful cadence of accountability. It's our meeting rhythms every week. So it's very detailed out. Everyone knows what's going on within the organization. Um, this, this kind of, you know, just the systems work we've done over the past two years has provided so much clarity and, uh, and really been um, a, a tremendous, um, you know, I would say influencer on our growth. I think that's been one of the uh, the most important things that we've done because I always say education times action equals results. That's sort of the the entry equation into multifamily investing. You got to get educated. You got to take massive action. That's going to yeah. get you in the game. But then it's a it's a business, okay? It's income versus yeah. expenses. It's people, systems, and culture. I'm going to say that again. Multifamily is like any other business. It's people, systems, and culture. And to get that well-oiled machine, you have to show up. You got to be working on those rock habits. And, and day in and day out, that's what we're working to perfect. And, and look, we got a long ways to go, but I, I think our future is very bright, uh, you know, because this is where our, our attention and focus is. Yeah. Yeah. And I love going back to what you were saying earlier is like the, the Kajabi, like training for your tech and, you know, your PM, your property management company, like having training in-house, going back to that, like you're, you're constantly investing in the education of your employees. Um, and as we're well, big the, believers in education, I mean, we've spent in the last few years, probably over 300 grand just on education wow. for our companies. And so I think it's, 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 you know, very powerful. If, uh, you know, if you're not doing that, you know, I, I think myself just you know, every day waking up, hitting the audible hard, always yeah. looking for, you know, the, the competitive uh, advantages and edge. So I think, you know, if you're going to be in business, you gotta, you gotta be doing that. So. Side note, um, I'm currently listening on Audible to Atlas Shrugged, and I thought you would appreciate that. <laughs> Just because I've named all my companies after uh, the different characters? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'm sitting on a huge, if I could show you, I'm sitting on a huge white Rand rug right now. So I got, the, <laughs> I got my Rand partner's rug. It's a beautiful thing, but I don't know that the, that the uh, setup here is going to allow for it. But That's awesome. Um, but yeah, no, I, I love that you said, you pointed out clarity because um, it's, it's funny too. You were talking about like doing your, your quarterly goal setting. We just did that for holiday ventures just last week. And at, you know, I'm looking at it right here, right in front of my desk. I have two pages of, we, we focus on the EOS traction entrepreneur operating system. We, yes. Yes. No, we, we definitely we went through that a little bit. We, so we did yeah. a little bit of both. We, we, we kind of settled on uh, scaling up, but I think EOS is fantastic. We, we do the L10. Yeah. 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 So that, that's exactly what I'm looking at is what we talked about and updating that and, and having that current and having that as a weekly discussion item of, Hey, how are we doing on our 90 day goals? And how is that going to affect our, our year long goals? Um, and just always being mindful of that and are the actions that we're taking today or tomorrow or this week working towards those rocks? Um, and then being able to, what's that? Now, let me, let me give a quick tip to everybody out there that is whether you're doing asset management or you actually have employees, you need to meet with your team weekly. Okay. And let's, let's just call it a property. Say you got property yeah. X, you need to be meeting with the leadership from property X every week. We have, we, we still do the L10. We call it a level 10 meeting. We have a Google, uh, Google doc, Google sheet, whatever the hell you call it. I'm not a tech guy. We go in, everyone has visibility on the zoom call at the top. It has the quarterly priorities. We hit the KPIs first in the beginning of the meeting um, on certain weeks of the month, we hit delinquency certain weeks of the month we hit budgets. Okay. So you have four weeks, we'll hit, you know, various things. So it's, it's, it's reviewing the quarterly priorities, the KPIs, and then we reverse engineer it. What are we doing to ensure that we're hitting those quarterly priorities under the tasks? But there can be other things that are not related. The tasks are shorter, quicker things. This may take you two hours, you know, less than due. Quarterly priorities, more than eight. 
but it may be something simple as, hey, we got to get the, prop, uh, the, the parking lot sealed and striped. Where are we at with that? And then I don't have to pick up the phone and call the property manager. I will go in remotely, update the tasks on the L10, and then it may be the first discussion point once we get through those first KPIs and things. And they say, oh, this is new. I didn't see this last week. Yes, we're going to, you know, you know, based on it's six years, every six years we get the parking lot done. I, I realized, you know, based on our other doc that we need to get this done, yada, yada, yada. You need to be doing that, though, if you're an asset manager as well. And I think the asset managers where they struggle at times, maybe get distant. You need to be on with that PM weekly and, and, and reviewing this. And if they have yeah. a problem with it, I, you know, I, I would challenge that relationship because I think it's vital. And it's been one of the things that have really propelled our business. And these are our own employees. I mean, we're meeting with them. But I, I would say, you know, because not everyone wants to self-manage. Right. But you still have to have that cadence and accountability <clears throat> with these folks. Um, if, if, look if you want to have a high level of success in your business. I think you can do it. And, and I'm not going to say that by not meeting with the PM, it, it won't work. I wouldn't be comfortable with it personally. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. I, I'm glad you brought that up is like, I, I think weekly meetings are, are important for any kind of leadership role to have with the, the people that report to them. And especially like in asset management, you're, you basically have a living, breathing company at your property, more or less. It's like its own little business. And you need to make sure that thing is operating like a well you need to be, machine. Yeah, you need to be having the vision and the direction or else they're going to, you know, go based on their vision and direction. If you're not providing yeah. that leadership. Yeah. I love it. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, as far as, as far as like BHAG, like big, hairy, audacious goals for RAN, for all the RAN companies. Um, do you have kind of in your mind, a vision of what that looks like? It's actually, so it's actually on our Monday morning huddle right? And it's to have an NPS score of 75 <clears throat> or greater. Um, so that's, you know, as part of this, this customer, uh, you know, service, you know, uh, battle that we're going through, you know, day in and day out. So we do uh, NPS score, net promoter scores. And, you know, world class is, you know, 75 or greater. And especially everyone, you know, listening knows how challenging property management can be. So day in and day out, you know, we're striving to hit that NPS score of 75 or greater. We have properties that are doing it, but it's, it's a collective average we want to hit for 75 or greater. So that really is our BHAG. You know, personally, look, you know, we're on our way. We want to have, you know, a, a billion dollars of assets under management. But realistically, the way we get there is providing that you know, amazing level of customer service. And that's what we strive to as an organization every day to hit. So on the, on the RPM side, that's what, you know, day in and day out we're working towards. That's awesome. Um, that's, a, that's a great way to look at it, too, is the net promoter score. That's a, that's a tangible way to be able to measure the success of your, your customer service. Yes. I love it. Uh, what about as far as, can you talk to us a little bit about like how you started with one company and now, I, I don't even know how many companies you have, but you have Dude, quite I a get, few. The beautiful thing is I get paid like over 45 ways every month. So be, because there's various That's LLCs, awesome. each, yeah. each property that we have is in its own LLC. You know, there's property management fees that come off it. There's asset management fees. Uh, you know, we have an education company, the mortgage company. So I don't know the, the exact number, but I do know that there's, I have over 45 ways on my, I call it my payout grid <laughs> that I look at every, <laughs> every week. But um, so like the vertical integration was so cool because I think so many people get caught up in this shiny ob object syndrome where, you know, one week it might be, I'm going to fix and flip, or you know what, Bitcoin's hot. Well, gold's going down to 1100 and, and yeah. they're all over the place. And so what, we, what we've attempted to do is to stay in our lane. And I think one of the biggest advantages to multifamily is time. The longer you stay in it and, and you operate well, the more profitable your asset becomes. And, and I think that through excellent management, you will grow your cash flow over time. So we really tried to stay in our lane and find you know, businesses within the business. The first one was laundry. We got into it. We were like, okay, we're not necessarily going to be collecting the quarters, but we had another stream of revenue coming from laundry. And we started looking at these different ways. We documented our journey and that's where the education came, uh, company came from. We wrote a book. Buy right, manage right, and finance right. That's trademark. That's really how we saw multifamily through our lenses by doing. You have to buy these things right. You have to have parameters in place that you're going to buy on cash flow. The management is, is wildly important. We've touched on that a lot. You have to have certain parameters and, and KPIs in place for your management. And then long-term fixed rate financing over time, this non-recourse, we have parameters there. So it's, it's putting this, this framework in place and staying in the lane, taking the long view. And anything that will be you know, based around multifamily, we've tried to control the process. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I love how you, you said it's like you're looking at the businesses within the business. 
Um, and what is serving that business? What are you touching? Um, what are you paying for? Uh, you know, in our, in our development business with holiday ventures, I mean, we look at, we're like, all right, well, we pay mainly architects and engineers. They probably make the most on these projects and general contractors, um, you know, other than ourselves and our investors, they're probably make the most. So, you know, we started an architect company, we started a GC company, you know, down the line, we'll probably follow you all and start a property management company. So the beautiful um, so thing is we're, we're actually going to start development next year. So you come to me, we'll have a meeting. I'll talk about PMs with you and you'll talk yeah. about the Cause yeah, we have uh, they got the, the person actually heads up our CapEx crew, which is a renovations team. We call it CapEx crew is uh, he's getting his GC license right now. And we've, we've identified a few spots next to properties that we currently own that we're, we want to start development on. So, you know, and then, and then you have yeah. the, the education arm that leads to this. And now we just uh, developed a relationship and maybe we can do some business together. Dude, I love it. Yeah. Making deals happen right on the podcast. Dude, let's do it. Let's go. <laughs> Guys, that's how it happens. Um, side note, everybody listening, this is why I love podcasts uh, because you get to build relationships while you're talking right here. You get to learn about somebody, ask them a bunch of questions, learn yourself and share that knowledge and build a relationship all out of it. Um, so Gino, Gino never shies away from saying you learn syndication by interviewing syndicators. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, it's amazing yeah. the amount of people that are that are learning that way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I love it. Uh, that's that's awesome. You guys are getting into development. We'll have to talk about that more. Yeah. Um, so, as far as the each each new business, did you decide to hire somebody to run that business, or did you guys start it and then hand it off to somebody, or how how was that progression as far as the many different verticals and who is at the end of the day in charge of it? Yeah. So, you know, early on we had this sort of, I'm a mentality. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do everything. I shit you not on our first property. I bought this like orange lawnmower and I thought, look, I'm going to manage it. I'm going to work a 40 hour week job. I'm going to do all the the work on it. And I quickly realized that's not scalable. You can't do that. So I'm a died relatively quickly. Still, still slip back to I'm every once in a while, but uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta put, put I'm off to the side, but yeah. And we had a little break up there. So I'm going to, yeah, we did with this, but uh, no, ultimately, ultimately it was, you know, promoting from within a lot of times we, you know, we had that big customer service push. And so we actually hired um, our third property manager from Ruth Chris. We were there getting a deal finance. We're doing 136 units. We're there with the bank and this, this, you know, the server that, that night just was phenomenally on point with the customer service. And I, um, you know, I, I was like, Gina, you got to go, you know, say you're older than me. It's going to look like I'm hitting on her. <laughs> if I go up, you got to go get her number because I think she'd be a perfect fit for what we're trying to do. And uh, he wouldn't do it ultimately. So I had to go up. It was a little creepy, but ultimately we interviewed this person and um, she's actually become our regional manager now. And what we found early on was people at Ruth Chris and some of these other high-end steakhouses had great customer service training. Mm. And we were looking for that more than the property management stuff. So that was a way early on that we were able to recruit people with the, the skills and the qualities that we were looking for. And then we taught them the, the property management side. And that's been a, a tremendous help for us. But, that's a great uh, even, piece of advice. Yeah. And, and, and even like, you know, if you look so, so real, you know, if you're looking at, you know, people that are heading different things up, you definitely hired people to, you know, be the leaders of, you know, the different entities within the organization and then just, you know, have the, have the quarterly meetings, get everyone together, have a lot of transparency and, you know, create a lot of opportunities for folks. So. Yeah, that's powerful. Um, and I think that that is good for people to hear is the, the IMA story. Um, because, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. It, it, it takes so much energy out of you and you can't wear a hundred hats and be truly be successful in real estate, really in any business. Team sport. Um, yeah, it really is. I mean, it takes a village to be able to do these deals and to be able to do them right. And if you want to really excel and take it to that next level and become vertically integrated, like you and Gino have done so well, um, you need to, you know, put, put people in the right seats that match up with their skill level and their, their passion and drive and desire and empower them and give them opportunities. You know what the IMA test is? What's that? 
if you know the name of the the pro desk manager at home depot (laughs) if you know if you know the pro desk manager at lowe's or home depot by first name you're an ima and you got to cut that yeah so yeah what um i wonder what the what the the multifamily, the next level version of that is HD supply. If you know your HD HD rep, you're you're doing something wrong. Yeah. Um, that's funny. If you know your CentOS rep. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I love it. Uh, well, even the apartments.com, like I don't, I don't know, you know, any of our reps anymore or anything like that definitely did, you know, back in the beginning, but, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's important to, you know, get the right people on board, trust them, you know, nurture them and, 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 you know, let them do the thing. So, yeah. Well, you guys have done an excellent job of that. Um, the last thing I wanted to ask you before we jump into our monumental questions, um, do you have any, any last kind of parting advice that you would give to those that are looking to expand their multifamily investing and their, their impact? Yeah, I, I think the, the biggest thing is going back to time. Um, time is going to be on your side. And so many people get into this space and they see that as, as like this pie in the sky. You know, this is, guys, I, I grew up, you know, I, I don't want to say poor, but extremely middle class. Like, you know, we had nice Christmases and things, but, you know, there's, there was never an, like an abundance at my house as, as a kid. So, it's, look, this is not about where you came from or anything else. This is about your hustle, your drive, and your commitment, how long you're willing to stick with it. So, it's not this pie in the sky. It's, it's, it's a matter of when, okay? If you stay in the game, you continue doing offers, continue building relationships, going to events. Um, so I think the biggest thing is just stick it until it works out. Like I said, it took us almost two years to get our first deal. That's because we didn't have enough education. We didn't necessarily know what we were doing. If we had better systems in place and we would have learned from people, we could have gone a lot quicker. But regardless, if, if you know that this is the right vehicle for you, stick it out until you yeah. make it work. Just don't quit. It's not, this is not rocket science, okay? Multifamily, it's, it is a business. Like I said before, people, systems, culture, comes down to income versus expenses, okay? This is not it's like something crazy, but so many people think it's not for me. Do a six unit. If that's, if that's where your comfort yeah. level is right now, do a six unit deal, okay? Uh, do a four unit deal. And then you're gonna realize, wow, 10 unit is, is not that much different. Then you're gonna realize 30 units. Wow, this is a pain in the ass because I should be doing 100 units with employees. Yeah. Exactly. And that's, and that's where you're going to go. But, but here's the thing, hear me saying this, but then go do it, you know, because it's like, you're, you're going to believe it when you see it for yourself. Yeah. So like, I don't, I don't see any reason why you shouldn't start with something that you feel like you can take down. Um, but I know that this is, this is the monumental podcast as well. And that, uh, you know, it's about giving back as well. So I think, you know, what we've, what we've learned, we've talked about culture a lot, is that when you're able to do things really nicely for the community, it comes back in so many ways for culture building as well. Uh, you know, so there's a lot, there's a big push, you know, maybe three, four years ago from our folks saying, hey, we want to be more active in the community. And, and this is, I'll be completely honest, this was not something that I let up, but I embraced it. And I said, okay, gang, I'm, I'm all for it. But I said, number one thing that we're going to do is we're going to feed the kids because the kids don't have a choice. Kids going hungry breaks my heart. And I said, if we're going to yeah. do something good, I love to eat and I don't like the idea of kids being hungry. So if we're going to do this thing, we're going to kick it off. Rand Cares is going to feed kids. The first year we fed over 10,000 kids you know, on wow. Thanksgiving and we've continued Amazing. to build, build on that year in and year out. So, um, but we've, we've done you know, a bunch of other things where you know, we've built playgrounds and, and just straight up donated to you know, you know, people's charities and things. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's that life of abundance. It's picking the right vehicle that allows you to do these things. Whereas if, you know, as I was a, if I was a gym teacher, like I, my initial path went out, these things wouldn't be happening. So I yeah. that's something we got to be, you know, very aware of. Yeah. Yeah. I beautifully said, it's like the vehicle is multifamily investing, which allows that impact piece to grow and flourish. So you can live in a life of abundance and also give back in a life of abundance to others. And, and that culture piece becomes so much fun. Like we're going on, we have an annual whitewater rafting trip that we do. Dude, we're going to have this badass band this year, we're, we, you know, huge cookout. There's this place called Base Camp where everyone goes and plays asshole at night afterwards, you know, bonfire and things. So it's like people like, and 
oh man, I wish I could get it. I got these freaking awesome knives for everybody. They're like little pocket knives with these leather straps. It says Rand Fam on it. But nice. I mean, this is the stuff that gets me juiced up. I mean, one of the yeah. biggest you know, problems we have right now is we have like these party planning committees and I take up too much time talking about like the different swag gifts we can get and, and put like Rand logos on them. But uh, <laughs> you know, that's when it gets fun, right? So, that's awesome. So it, it wasn't intended to be like this big Rambo thing. But uh, I, I got it right here. So we got we got the Rand Fam, you know, Gen One. Oh, like, nice! Look at that! Look at that bad boy, huh? Dang! <laughs> that is a solid pocket knife. Yeah, that is a solid pocket knife. Might be a little big for some folks, but uh, <laughs> yeah. hopefully this doesn't come out before the uh, rafting trip because uh, shh, it's a surprise. Yeah, yeah. But surprise, everybody! All right, um, keep quiet, everybody listening. Uh, but amazing amazing content um i love everything we've been able to talk to talk about today um let's jump in quickly to our monumental questions what does success mean to you yeah success every day is it's it's just i'm a uh a responsibility junkie and so i feel responsible for our folks you know on the ran fam team i feel responsible for our residents and I feel responsible for my family. So it's every day showing up. I start my day every day here, 6 a.m., getting my, getting my shit done, getting organized and making sure that I'm taking care of the folks that take care of me. And, and so I think that it's, it's, it's a lifestyle by design, which is great. It's, it's creating a life of abundance for my family, the folks on the team. We allow the folks that work for the company to reinvest the deals to grow their wealth as, you know, in addition yeah. to ours. So it's, it's just, it's, it's creating that life of abundance and, and influencing all the folks that I'm responsible for. And it goes back to what we were saying earlier, our number one priority when COVID hit is we made a commitment to the entire team that we weren't allowing, you know, any layoffs. And, and I know yeah. so many people were just axing, uh, you know, people and, and yeah. laying off huge amounts of their staff where our folks have confidence in us. And, and it may be, you know, a little bit like the, the whole Tommy boy thing where his dad had that close relationship with everybody. And, and it was, it was, a, it was a tight knit culture, but dude, that's awesome, man. Like if you're going to go out there and create a great community yeah. for the folks you work with that, that gives me juice and, and so much pride in what Gino and I are doing. I wholeheartedly agree. I, I think that's powerful when you can give that assurance to people and build that culture around that. Um, you just build a fun place to work and, a, a, you know, some yeah, best friends the, along the I way. I saw the other side of it, right? You know, going back to yeah. 08 where it was like, hey, go sit by your phone, you know, <clears> let <throat> you know if you have a job. That's, yeah. Like, come on, man. Like, no one Yeah, that's a terrible that way to run. Yeah. Um, what about daily habits, morning rituals? You just talked about you start every day, 6 a.m. at your desk. Yeah. So the, right here, I got this, this is, this is, this is my coach's sheet and everyone on the team nice. picks on me because they, they got me on Google calendar and shit. And I'm like, yeah. I don't care. Sunday morning, I write it down and I try, you know, like even we have social media teams and things pushing stuff out there, but I try to get it, you know, a couple social posts out there. I have, uh, you know, like certain meal goals that I hit every morning. Uh, I meditate in the morning. I hit audible um, and I stretch and, uh, and I work out. So, you know, before 10, you know, I have a, a hardcore push between six and 10 AM where not only do I get my, my, my shit done for work, you know, I get all my emails out, you know, make sure my admin is done any, any calls, but then I'm taking care of myself uh, as well with the stretching, the meditation, e educating myself. I live in a really cool neighborhood that has Hills. And so I can literally get on my bike, go hit some Hill sprints, get a really nice, you know, kind of like anaerobic cardio slash cardio workout in. And I got a gym underneath uh, my bedroom here. So I have this great little, you know, setup going where between six and 10 AM, I am productive AF. We're going to keep it, you know, like, yeah, uh, I love it clean here. But, uh, <laughs> and then, and then, you know, like it's three o'clock right now or whatever, we're hitting the podcast and, you know, typically, you know, my day winds down around, you know, six or whatever, but, uh, it's, it's 12 hours of, of extreme productivity. And, um, you know, today I was out at, uh, one of our properties looking at some renovations, stopped into the office for a little bit. And, uh, it's, it's, dude, it's, it's, it's a good thing. I, I really enjoy um, just, like I said, keeping it boring and, and continuing the, the solid growth and, and working on creating a well-oiled machine. Yeah. I love it. Um, I love how you, you really have it down to a science and you so figured out back, the time that works for you. Yeah. It, it came back though from when I was in pharma, uh, I saw so many of these reps that like didn't know where they were going. They would kind of like, oh, I'll go here or there. I, you know, I came prepared and I was like, all right, I'm going to hit these doctors. I know what times are available and, and creating that, those efficiencies. And dude, I'm telling you, little dopamine kicks here, crossing stuff off the list, hitting it. Yeah. And, and I don't miss anything. And if I do miss something, I put it on the back and it rolls into the next week. And, and yeah. dude, I'm telling you, I get like, they pick on me so much for being like this old corny guy that walks around with a piece of cardstock. 
But dude, that has been one of the biggest things that has led to my successes. And everyone's like, oh, let me check and see when my meeting is. And they're like scrolling through. And I'm like, yeah, I'm available. Yeah, two, let's go. You know, and so it's, it's efficient, <laughs> man. I, I yeah. like That's awesome. Uh, final, final question. What is your favorite book or book you're currently reading? Yeah. So you alluded to it earlier, uh, Atlas Shrugged, you know, by far, I started reading that the first year Gina and I started investing. I think it had a tremendous impact on just the, the way I look at the world. Uh, the book talks about objectivism. I think it's, it's based in reason and, uh, and it, it literally made me 5% smarter. So if you want to get 5% smarter today, go read Atlas Shrugged. Nice. That's, that's, that's your guarantee. Okay. Today, yeah. from Evan, you got, you have, you have a money back guarantee from Evan today <laughs> that if, you, if you go read Atlas Shrugged, you're going to become 5% smarter. Boom. On the monumental podcast. Yeah. I, I think I'm like 16 hours in of like, I don't know what it is like 60 hour book or something. I'm, I'm only like a quarter of the way in and it's longer than most other books I've listened to on audible. I've gone through it three times. Wow. That's yeah. impressive. Well, I, I've already loved it so far. Um, but guys, uh, phenomenal episode with Jake. Jake, how can our monumental listeners reach out to you, follow you, connect with you? Yeah, easiest way, go to Jake and it's A N D, Jake and Gino.com forward slash honeybee. Uh, that's the book that we just wrote. And the really cool thing is you can actually download our credibility book that we talked about earlier, that early pitch book. And look, rip off and duplicate. If it, if it helps you, yeah. and you find things in it, we're, we're, you know, we're not prude. You guys can use the resources in there. And there's different you know, resources based around the honeybee. That's, that's the book that we just wrote, you know, uh, all about vertical integration. So, uh, and you can download our podcast. Uh, I know Evan's been on there. So you can get, get more of uh, the e-juice over there. And, and if you want, yeah. apply to work with our team. So that's what we got going on. Jake. I love it. Com. Yes. And also honeybee. I've read it. Phenomenal book. Uh, tells a great story and lots of lessons in there. Um, so guys, make sure to get that book, check out Jake, check out their website. Uh, they're doing phenomenal things. Amazing culture. Love today's episode. There's like way too many golden nuggets in here to, to list them all right now. Uh, but Jake, thank you again for being on. And monument, monumental listeners, if, if you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to share it on social media. And as well, uh, please leave us a review on iTunes. Uh, that really helps get the word out and share with more people the, the great guests that we have on here on Monumental, just like Jake today. Uh, and so with that, guys, have a monumental day. Monumental.